Good morning, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Hope you guys are doing well. Gonna start in a few minutes. I have your weapons set to be transferred. <laughs> they are, they've been blocked. And I added the antibody to them, the primary antibody to them this morning. Um, well, the trigger in the lab wasn't working either. So those people are walking their blocks too. But uh, yesterday exploded again. On Friday, it broke through. So I haven't been rocking them like they should be that much. Every now and then when I walk by them, I move them around a little bit. Typically, you would have them on the rocker. Um, your protocol says 30 minutes. Uh, I've never done antibody into primary antibody intubation that little for that little time. Usually, we like to do at least two hours. That gives the best results. Obviously, in a class setting, we can do a small incubation and still get, you know, some results to look at. But in an ideal setting, we want to do a minimum of two hours at room temperature, or we want to do overnight at four degrees while rocking. And the reason we rock them is so uh, you don't get too much background, right? So the molecules keep moving around and the antibodies have, you don't want to do it too fast, just a very gentle rock. And the antibody can find the antigens and bind to them and make that happen uh, at a more in a more consistent way. So uh, in our case, intermittent rocking is what we are getting. I added the antibodies about an hour and a half ago. Um, and so we'll talk about a little bit of what happened before then, before, you know, from the time that you left last week in lab till now, and then we will continue with our Western. And then during the incubation timings, we will go over the problem set and calculations and things like that, okay? Sounds like a plan? Cool. Sounds good. Can I my rocking motion? Actually, we have the fire detection slot in here too. Since I have chemo on Thursday, I didn't think I wanted to do this whole rocking business on Friday. To have everybody's thoughts together in one. Hopefully they work. Who knows? Oh, I left the antibody in the fridge. I will look at it. I will return. Okay. So I have over here the primary antibody, and oof, my eyesight has gone away with this cancer therapy. So the antibody says it's CREB monoclonal antibody, and it has its code number LC9, I believe, and it is mouse, I believe, somewhere. So what does that tell you? Actually, I'm gonna LB9, not LC9. I'm gonna look it up too, just so we can make sure I'm saying the right thing. Because it was written so small, I could not read. And retrogen, 35. No. 
antibody. What does that mean? When it says that, so this is just kind of reviewing. What does it mean um, when we look at antibodies? Who's gonna tell me? You guys can talk, you know. You could also write. We talked about antibodies and what they mean and how we make them. Very first, uh, first or second lab, right? In week one or two. And we talked about this structure and antigen versus antibody and all monoclonal versus polyclonal. So when it says that it's a crab monoclonal antibond and mouse monoclonal antibody, what does that mean? Um, monoclonal antibodies only bind to one um, epitope. Yes, so it has a particular epitope that it's made against and all the molecules in here are gonna all bind to the same spot on that antigen, right? Exactly same epitope on that antigen. They're not gonna bind all over, good. And because it says it's a mouse monoclonal, what does it mean by that? Is it against the mouse? Does that specify whether what it is against or where it was made? Anyone want to take a guess? Yes, Michaela? It's, it's where it binds, mm -mm. like not, okay, sorry. <laughs> so if it was uh, talking about where it is, you know, which kind of animal protein it's made against, it would say anti-mouse, anti-mouse crab. That mm -hmm. would mean that it is against the mouse crab. However, when it just says mouse, monoclonal, that means which animal it was made. Of. So yes, this crab True. does react to the mouse, right? It does bind to the mouse as well, because that's why we're using it, right? We had mouse brains. Um, it also binds to humans. It also binds to rabbits, right? So it is binding to multiple crabs, uh, crabs and multiple animals, because mm -hmm. crab is so conserved between all of them at that particular epitope, right? they could have made one that would only have bound to the mouse or only had bound to the human crab by choosing a different epitope. So the epitope they looked at will allow this antibody to be reactive against mouse, human, you know, uh, rabbit, crab. However, it is prepared in mouse. That's what we know when it says mouse monoclonal. Or if it said rabbit polyclonal, it would have meant that that antibody had uh, a mixture of antibodies, right? That bind to different epitopes all along that antigen and was made in rabbits. Cool, everyone good? Cool, so, so far so good. Let me share my screen and we kind of, you know, take a step back and go back to where we were last. So last week, when you guys left, we were transferring our plots, I believe, right? We hadn't finished transferring quite yet. And so once you left, I um, finished the transfer, I dismantled it. And the first thing that I did was that I stained them with a stain called Ponso stain. Are you guys able to see my screen? Yeah? Yep. Cool. So, um, you could have used a different stain too. So we had nitrocellulose membranes that are compatible with this type of staining. Ponzo stain is good because it works very, very quickly. It just instantaneously, you know, within a few seconds, you see your lanes, you see all the proteins, and then you can very quickly de-stain it also. So to remove the stain, I used a buffer made of TBS, which is a salt buffer, right, essentially. Chris buffered saline um, with some tween added to it, which is a zwitrionic detergent. And that detergent kind of helps it remove all the stain. 
within a few minutes, you just kind of shake it a couple of times, change the wash, and you are clean. You have a clean white membrane again, no protein showing, no band showing, and you can go on to the next step. So that was what we did, uh, what I did last time when you left. In your modules from last week, the page from last week, I posted a picture of ponso-stained proteins. So this is the, what the blood looked like when they were stained with ponso. This over here is your marker lane, right? This is the molecular weight marker, just like we've done last time, right? Same band, so you can match them with the ladder from last time. And then you have all your samples. Um, so I'm gonna look at your lane somewhere. Then I will tell you which lane is which, but kind of went by, you know, like if you have a group one, group one, two, three, four, um, in that order, essentially. I think the very first one is mine. This one is instructor, and then the rest of them are all of you. And overall, most of you had good proteins. Each band is, you know, a mixture of one, two, maybe three proteins that lay all at that particular molecular weight, right? And so you see lots and lots of proteins this time, right? It's not as simple as it was last time because these are uh, from the brain. These are from actual cellular extract and cells have a lot of proteins in them, right? Um, upwards of thousands of proteins in them. So that's what you have over there, and that's what you can see. This particular group had a um, much lower amount of protein. You can see that their extraction was maybe not as well done, uh, but what they had is good quality. You see nice, clean bands. And this particular group had um, a lot of degradation in their proteins, looks like it. You see with the smearing, that indicates that it wasn't as clean. Um, something happened to their, I don't know what they did. Maybe they used, I don't know exactly where they went wrong, whether they used um, a reagent that was not clean or whether um, they didn't leave it on ice. Something happened to that, that it is smeared and not nice and clean with individual bands. Uh, we'll see, maybe they'll still be able to detect crab. Does anyone know what the molecular weight of crab is? Anyone who looked at the protocol and read the modules? Is it um, 35 kilodaltons? Exactly. It's a lot, around 35 kilodaltons. So it's going to be down here, right? It's not very big. So that area seems pretty clear for most of you guys. So we'll see what it looks like. This particular groups, because they don't have nice clean bands, maybe it will look very small and just a dot, but Seems like there's protein there, just it's very uh, degraded in their case. Uh, it could have been that maybe they uh, either didn't add beta mercaptoethanol or they heated it too long. That is other. That are other reasons why you would get something like this as well. Uh, so yeah, so that's what it looks like. Any of these little holes that you see, you see like these little tiny holes, circles. What do you think those are? Is that the air pockets from not squeezing it out properly? Yeah. So those would be the bubbles that I talked about. So fortunately, they're super tiny, right? So that's not going to affect our Western in any way, shape, or form. It seems like uh, most of the place is nice and clean. No uh, big air pockets. A few tiny spots. On the Friday one, actually, I have a little bubble up here. But it's not at 35 kilodaltons, so we have right in there, too. Um, as long as it's not where I need to probe my membrane. Okay, so um, once we destain it, we remove you know all the stain. Then you have your white clean membrane back with all your proteins in there. Then what you need to do next is a step called blocking. And with that step, what that means is that we need to block all this non-specific site all this empty spot, all these empty spaces that don't have proteins on them, we want something to bind to it so that it does not add background to our analysis. Um, and we do that by using this reagent called blotto, 
which actually is essentially your TBS tween buffer with some milk added to it. It's like non-fat dry milk, 5% non-fat dry milk, TBS tween, and then we can add sodium azide as a preservative to it, and then you can keep it for a few days. I actually don't add sodium azide to it because um, even without it, it's good for four or five days anyway in the fridge. So I made this on Friday and it's perfectly fine and I can use it today and life is good. Um, however, so why do you think milk, non-fat dry milk would act as a good blocking material for our membrane? What do you think will, it will do? So what the milk does, milk has a lot of protein in it, right? So this is milk powder, non-fat dry milk. So it mostly has just those proteins in it. Um, but so what it does is that all those protein molecules, they are not from mouse, rabbit, or humans. So they are not going to interact with any of our antibodies in any way. And they are going to bind to all the sites that are open on our membrane, all the sites that nothing is bound to, right? That no protein is bound to. And they will block them. And by doing that, it is going to create a clean canvas for us. So the antibody binds only, because remember, the membrane is charged, right? To allow proteins to bind. Well, antibody is a protein. Otherwise, it would bind all over, and you are going to get lots of nonspecific binding and lots of bad ones. By blocking our membranes, we block out all those nonspecific sites, and then you get just the antibody binding to its antigen, just on that epitope and nowhere else. And you get a nice clean signal as opposed to a um, nonspecific background. Okay. Okay. So I think I've done enough of the primary incubation. It's been a bit. So we can, what we are going to be doing for the first part is now we are going to go through the protocol for today. And you guys are going to be my timekeepers and you are going to be the ones telling me what I should do next. So we are right now, right here. Okay. This is where we are. And we are doing this. So we've already blocked our membrane, right? So they are binding the milk proteins bound to the nitrocellulose. And we added the primary antibody. We talked about a primary antibody, the crab mono, mouse monoclonal antibody. And um, I allowed it to sit on there for about two hours. It's been there for two hours at room temperature with intermittent rocking in our case instead of rocking the whole time, which would have been better. So now our next step, the full protocol is down here. Let's go really open it. So let's see what our next step is going to be. Oh, where did it go? Right there. Why isn't it? Anyway, oh, right here. So let's go to our restaurant there. So I put it in 10 mils of lotto. That's what I use for my antibody. Okay, for uh, the thing for my anti-crab antibody. And I use 10 microliter and 10 ml, same thing. So this is my shaking, as you can see. Now, what should I do next? Um. Uh -huh. Is the is the blotto inside the um, the plates that you have? Yes. So we uh, incubate. We uh, make the antibody dilutions in blotto. So mm -hmm. that that white solution. I don't know if you can see it. I don't necessarily want to show you the background in my life. It's not bad, but we'll see if we can look at it a little bit more carefully. How come I can't see it? There you 
Canada. You see that? So it says milk with in the TBS queen. And that's what I'm using to uh, with my antibody. So that's mm -hmm. your blotto. Yeah. So what should I do next? Or off the blotto? Yep. So I'm going to remove the blotto. Uh, well, it's not blotto only. It's blotto with my primary antibody. Now, here is something else about it. Um, blotto actually, or this antibody can be reused for a few days if you are going to be running a lot of Westerns back to back and you are going to be using the same antibody, right? Every time, you can actually um, reuse them because as long as the milk is good, and especially if you have sodium azide added to it, you can reuse it for a few days. So, and many times I've done that, it doesn't reduce its efficacy at all. Um, so two, three times, absolutely no issues. You can just reuse the same antibody mixture. The only thing is you wanna keep it in the fridge, right? Otherwise the milk's gonna go bad and the antibodies are gonna degrade. So um, as long as you keep them at in the fridge, store them properly, and, you know, if I was running the, uh, more Westerns today, I could pour the same antibody on them, put it in the fridge overnight incubation. And that's actually the other thing that I like to do is I like to do overnight incubations with my antibodies. Uh, it gives you a more kind of consistent results, more stronger signal and cleaner bag run. Okay, so I have some, I didn't bring enough tubes from the lab, so I'm going to pour off the third block. And what should I do next? Next, it tells you to wash the membrane with 10 changes. Yes. So for washing the membrane, you could do what they have suggested again, 10 changes and you want to shake them in between for a minute each or you could do a little bit longer incubation uh, and just do three changes this very first change i do very quickly so that first change i just barely you know because it's going to be a lot of that antibody is going to come off in that first wash oh my goodness my shirt looks so weird with the camera Anyway, so you're gonna use this, you know, the first one I wanna do a little bit vigorous shaking and I'm gonna dump it. And then I'm gonna do the next one for we do three months in that three minutes. one. Now I want you guys to set up a three minute timer and we are going to do a three minute wash. And again, what we're gonna be doing with these washes is we are rocking them gently so that they remove the non-specific binding. A little bit like that affinity chromatography thing, right? Because in the affinity chromatography, you also washed multiple times, right? And the idea was that you're removing those antibody molecules, or in that case, the protein molecules that didn't get bound, that didn't bind where they needed to bind. So that's what we're doing. We had our antibody here. We wanna remove any non-specific binding, something that may be bound somewhere else uh, where it wasn't PREB, but obviously that's not gonna be very specific, so it won't be very strong binding, and it will strip off when we add the buffer. And also, it's going to remove any antibody that's just hanging out and not bound at all. Okay. Any questions? So far? So like I said, this is a very, um, if we were in the lab, it's very chill lab. We're just doing a lot of <laughs> walking and shaking our blobs because, you know, shaker's not working. 
So in the lab, normally what we do is remember how you loaded your marker and then your sample. We would have cut out those strips. You would have put them in a small, tiny plate, and then you would have just worked with your plate in your group. Um, oh, one of the things that we would have made our own is the TBS buffer, the washing buffer. So the wash buffer is a 10x buffer stock that we have in the lab. Uh, typically, you know, so you need 10 washes or you need multiple washes, you know, uh, the first time, and then you need another set of 10 washes later. So there's like three washes. So you need about 300 ml, let's say. So for 300 ml of the wash buffer, how much buffer the stock, the 10x stock, and how much water would you use? That's a good question, good example. So we want to make 300 ml of the buffer. And if again, if you were in the lab, you would have made your own to use for your station. You would need about 300 ml. How much water and how much buffer? The buffer stock is 10x. Would you use? Do you answer that question? I feel like it's been three minutes. 30? 30. 30 of what? Um, of the thirty of the um, what was he called? <laughs> the thirty milliliters of the buffer. Thirty milliliters of the buffer, and how many milliliters of water? Two seventy. Seventy. Okay, we'll do another wash. And so typically, you know, in our research lab, we do three washes, 10 minutes each. Or um, sometimes if we have a lot of something with a lot of background, we would use five washes, five minutes each. Um, we don't typically do uh, 10 changes. 10 changes is when you're just doing a quick change. Um, I'm actually kind of nervous about whether the antibody signal is gonna be there. I'd rather see background than no signal, right? Especially since we've been, uh, the antibody that I have is from, uh, I don't know when it's from, what is it? Spring 22, so it's from last year, it should be fine. But still, you know, I don't know. I'm, so I'd rather underwash than overwash today for sure. So we're gonna just make this, this is our third wash, um, kind of fourth because I did a quick change again inside. And so we'll do this for maybe three to five minutes, three minutes, and then we'll go ahead, go ahead and put our secondary in, okay? Let's keep the buffer for our washing, the secondary. Sounds good? Yep. Any questions so far? Next week, we are also going to be meeting through Zoom. And the following week, we are going to be running the ELISA in person, I believe. We're going to try at least. Let's see. I'm hopeful that we will be able to run the ELISA in person. The ELISA is going to be a little bit different, and I will give you a little bit of background on that today. Well, not today, next week. 
we will talk about ELISA. We're going to do a different type of ELISA than um, we used to do. So they used to do a direct ELISA. We're going to do a sandwich ELISA. So we'll talk about that next week. Um, and the Monday sections are going to code the plates for us because they're meeting in person every week. Uh, that's taught by Kelsey. So I'm going to give her the protocol uh, to do that. And then we are going to be using our samples on them to look for CREV and to um, make our actual, you know, quantify how much CREV we have in our sample. So looking at the Western again, right, uh, just going back for a second uh, at the Ponzo stain sample again. Right here. So remember how we talked about the importance of equalizing our sample, right? Um, I think. Open up. So if we look at this one, right, we can see that there are different amounts of protein in different samples. Um, and you can imagine if you had, you know, samples that you were trying to compare levels of CREB in, uh, maybe in an untreated versus, you know, various types of treatment or over time, you wouldn't really be able to do that comparison on this accurately, unless these three samples were the only ones you cared about because you had different amounts of proteins, right? Some of them are overloaded. They have more proteins than others. What you would want in an ideal setting is that all of them have the exact same intensity of these bands. And so if you remember, we had loaded that second blot um, where you guys had equalized it and only loaded the amount that you were supposed to. Uh, I have that in here and we will look at if it works good, we will be able to see if that shows a difference in the expression pattern. And that would then show you how those levels um, change when you have different amounts of proteins versus exactly the same amount of proteins to start with. Okay, so it's been four minutes for washing. So I'm gonna go ahead. Now you never wanna dry these blots, okay? So this is something to be, um, to remember that you, want to have things ready to put in the next thing before you are uh, before you wash them okay before you remove the wash buffer so i'm going to go ahead and make my secondary solution let's go ahead and look at our protocol again and see what i need to add they're right here and now we are on step five so I have three blocks that I'm making this for. So how much should I take? How much should I take for three blocks? Like 3.3 .3 for each. Um, well, no, so I need 10 ml of that, right? So I need that for every single block. I have three blocks. How much total volume of blotto and how much total volume of antibody do I need? 30 milliliters of blotto. Yeah, 30 milliliters of blotto. And then how much of the antibody? Um, 15 microliters of alkaline phosphatase conjugated goat anti-mouse <laughs> secondary antibody. Yeah, and we'll talk about what that means, those big words, so start thinking about them. And because these tiny tubes and tiny volumes are not being very useful, I'm just going to pour and unpour to make sure I get everything out. And also because I got like just a P10 pipette here, micro pipette, I didn't. So, yeah, that's my secondary. 
hopefully it's a good second door you can have some some shrimp on there. I'm gonna go ahead and pour off my wash and then instead pour the secondary solution into my oven. Okay, I got my secretary about approximately 10 ml on each. And I have a foil cover on them so I can stack them and rock them. And now let's talk about what that secondary means. So we have alkaline phosphatase conjugated goat anti-mouse secondary. So which animal was the secondary made in or purified form? Goat. Yep. And which animal IgG is it against? Mouse. Mouse. And why are we using the anti-mouse secondary? Because we use mouse primary antibodies. Because what? Because we use mouse primary antibodies. Exactly, because our primary antibody was made in mouse. So we have to use a mouse secondary. If instead our primary antibody was anti-mouse but rabbit monoclonal, then your secondary that you will use will be anti-rabbit. So your secondary has to match the animal where the primary antibody was purified from, okay? Because it's gonna be against that particular antibody or IgG from that particular animal. What's the purpose of this secondary antibody? Why do we use it? Uh, it amplifies the signal and it has the little uh, phosphatase on it so we can get the signal in the first place more strongly. Okay, so it has two purposes, right? One is to amplify the signal. How does it amplify the signal? It can bind to the primary antibody in multiple locations. So there will be like three for each one or even more than that. Why? Uh, because it can recognize multiple epitopes on the primary antibody. Yeah, so it's not recognizing the epitope that it's, you know, the actual epitope that the antibody was against. It's recognizing the IgG portion of it, right? All that constant portion of it. And it's going to bind all over it. So it's going to amplify your signal and give you a better response. And then the second part of this is to provide you with a way to find it, to observe it. So they can come in you know, different ways. It could be a color metric assay, or it could be a chemiluminescent assay, fluorescent assay. Depends on what that signal is that you're going to be looking at. Um, so, you know, they can be made with a GFP attached to it. It could be made with some other RFP, YFP, so some fluorescent signal. They could be using harsh radish peroxidase, which you would then need to look at um, under, uh, you know, in the dark room with a film or do uh, look at basically an autoradiograph of that. Or you could have alkaline phosphatase. Now with alkaline phosphatase, you could also get a chemiluminescent signal as well. Um, it's less sensitive than horseradish peroxid peroxidase, which gives a, the most robust signal. Uh, but the good part with alkaline phosphatase is that you can also you can have a chemiluminescent signal. You can also have a colorimetric assay. And what we are going to be doing is a colorimetric assay. So we are going to be developing that uh, color in the second part uh, with our substrate for alkaline phosphatase that's gonna react, bind to it and change the color at the spot where it is attached. Um, and hopefully that spot is gonna be just a crib and maybe a little bit extra since we didn't watch too much. Um, 
So that's what we are going to be using. Cool? Yes? No? Maybe? Cool. Cool. Um, and I believe this one gives like a purple colored substrate. A lot of our ELISAs are also also use the alkaline phosphatase as the signal in the beginning, and they will convert into like a purple color. Uh, the more purple you see, the more of that particular protein, crab or galactin or whatever it is that the ELISA is for you see. Um, some of them have a different epitope, uh, different signal, and it turns yellow. I know our caspase 3 turns yellow and it goes like lemon to dark yellow, depending on how much activity is there. So it depends on what type of color molecule they're uh, going to break down into when the substrate reacts with the alkaline phosphatase. Okay, so I'm gonna, you know, I can't do it for 30 minutes, so I'm gonna put it down. You guys, every five minutes or so, remind me to shake it up a little bit. And we'll do that for uh, 30 minutes. And while we're doing that, we will also look at our uh, problem set and analysis, okay? Yep. Cool. Yeah, so that's the color that we expect to see for purple color. Um, where did the problem set link go? Should have been that one. Okay, well, my link in the box too. The fan on my computer is going with this. I don't know, I'm having it do too much work. Okay, so. The problem set is going to start off with you guys making, again, a standard curve. Uh, hopefully this time most of you got better curves than last time, right? Um, I thought the data looked a little bit better for most of you than last time, if not uh, for all of you, which is good. Uh, what trend line worked the best for most when you made the standard curve? So for ours, our R squared was the same for all three um, graphs. <laughs> Interesting. Was it a good R squared? Yeah, it's mm. decent, 0.89. That's not decent. Decent <laughs> is 0.95 and above, preferably 0.97 and above. But, okay. But it was the same. That's interesting. Uh, was it more linearly looking? For yours? Oh, on that note, where's my, I don't think I have my data here that we can play with. Constructors or no? It look a little bit curved. It looks a little bit curved. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, can I go back? Everything. Okay, so for this one, the first thing that you guys would have should have looked at was obviously having your standard curve that's going to be using the those first two lanes, and you're going to be using number one through eleven, just like we did before, uh, doing your blank subtraction with the average of these two, and then plotting the averages of the rest, and making your curve. Then you should be looking at your unknowns and for your unknowns you're going to have the top one i believe should be 110 one, two, ten. this should be your one two five and then you should have your undiluted right and in your own samples you would have them in a row instead and they would be the same way similarly um, and you want to look at them and see which one makes sense. Now, for most of you, your undiluted is probably going to be outside the range, which means it's not going to be able to quantify it very well, especially if you're doing it a polynomial equation. And so you, then you would be working with one of your other numbers, one-fifth or one-tenth, and quantifying those. 
Again, that stuff we did last time in class. Um, you can get rid of up to two data points to get a better curves. If all you have uh, out of line are two data points that are making your curve incorrect, yes, you may do so. Okay, I will allow you to do so. And we do the same thing in research setting as well. Okay, so that part is going to be then just for that. Um, enable editing. So you're going to put in your graph in there, just like last time. Make sure it's properly formatted. Oh, come on, man. Um, that it has no border, no grid lines, that the equation is visible. Now, for many of you, the first time around, the equations were not visible to me in Canvas until I downloaded the assignment. So you want to make sure to copy your graphs with the equation visible on that and the R score visible on them in Excel, and then do a paste special as picture into your document so I can actually visibly see the equation and the R square. It makes my life a lot easier if that's the case, and I don't need to download 10,000 you know, uh, different assignments. Then you have your dilutions that you were playing with. So now uh, you need to think about which one you needed to you used and why. So I'm looking for basically you thinking about the range of your standard curve, the accuracy of the dilutions that you prepared, and taking both of those into account when you are choosing the one to quantify. And then you have the third part is obviously just getting the concentrations. Again, something that we already did last time. Um, now for your ELISA, oh, thank you. Let's take for a minute or so. For question number four and five, you are doing calculations that you're going to need for your, um, you know, either washing or for your ELISA next time. Uh, so for ELISA, we, again, we have to load the exact same amount of protein. So last time we calculated for 20 micrograms of total protein or 10 micrograms. This time we want to calculate for a total of 100 micrograms per mil for the ELISA, right? So whatever your concentration is, you want to now first calculate um, what you have right now, and then you want to change it. So you want to add your buffer to it so that your final concentration is down to 100 micrograms per milliliter. How would you do that? So this is part of equalization that what we do is we first calculate how much volume, uh, how much, what concentration we have, how much of that concent, uh, you know, if we had that concentration, how much volume you would need to get a particular amount. But then also that uh, we can make all our samples at the same concentration, so we can add the same amount of protein in our assay for all our samples. Okay. So, so can we use the values for question three. You use the values that you got from uh, the number three to calculate number four. Yes. Okay. So let's say that I had five mg per mil. Let's just use that as an example. Five milligrams per milliliter of protein in my starting sample. What should I do next? So. Just I'm gonna you know use this space to write that. So let's say my starting concentration, right, is five mix per mil. How many micrograms per microliter is that? Point zero zero are actually 500? Not or... 500 and not 0. 0.00, but yeah. what? How many milligrams in a gram, or how many micrograms in a milligram? Mm. 
Micro is to the negative ninth, right? That's right. Yes, oh, but milligram, yes, but from grams. But with milligram compared to microgram, how many micrograms in a milligram? Isn't it like a thousandth? So yes, perfect. And how many microliters in a milliliter? The same thing. Also a thousand. So it's a one-to-one -one ratio, which means you have the same numbers of micrograms per microliter. So if you have five milligrams per milliliter, you essentially have five micrograms per microliter in your sample. Okay? Understood? Yes? No? Yeah. Good. Okay. So, however, the concentration that, shall check time again. That's too quick. Yes, I'll check it. Just give me a sec. Um, in here, they want you to create a very diluted sample, right? They want you to use, prepare a sample that's 100 micrograms per milliliter. So a little bit different notation, right? So we want micrograms per milliliter. That's what we want. So this is going to be, if you were looking at our favorite formula, right? C1, V1 equals C2, V2. 100 micrograms per milliliter is our final concentration, okay? What should I write for my C1? So I know it's five milligrams per milliliter. So how many micrograms per milliliter is that? 5,000 micrograms per milliliter. Yes, perfect. So it's 5,000 micrograms per milliliter, right? So how much of that volume would I need to get 100 micrograms per milliliter final concentration? In what volume? What was the final volume they were looking for? What's the final volume of this um, a solution that we need? 220 microliters. 120 microliters. Yes. Which you can convert into, you know, milliliters or convert these into microliters. So everything is in the same units. And then V1 is our X. So go ahead and solve it out and tell me how many microliters of your starting solution. Do you need up to 5,000 microgram per mil to get 100 microgram per milliliter of your final uh, solution? Yeah. Gel shake done. So go ahead and calculate. Is it um, 0. 0.44? 0. 0.44 what? Microliters. We have 100 micrograms per milliliter. Four point four <laughs> microliters. Four point four. That's correct. Zero point one microgram per microliter, essentially. 
and you're going to be using 220 microliter total. So you need 22 micrograms total of your material. And so you just do 5,000 divided by 22. So you should get how many? So you have 5,000 divided. You have five, and so it's 22 divided by five, 4.4, 4, exactly. Cool, so this should be 4.4 4 microliters. Did everyone get 4.4 4 microliters? And or if you didn't, do you understand how you got 4.4 4 microliters? That could be a bunch of 4.4s, which is a good thing. Okay, so that's how much of your protein, grain protein, you're going to use, right? How much of the diluents, which is going to be your PBS, are you going to use? Two hundred and Del Shake got it. So how much of the diluent am I going to use to get my 100 microgram per milliliter concentration? Remember, this is not how much crab is there. It's just all those brain proteins, right? All 40,000 of them that are hanging out in that brain. PBS in microliters? Yeah. What's the total volume that we're trying to get to? Two hundred and twenty. Good. So four point four of that two twenty is going to be brain protein. How much of that is going to be the PBS? But how did you get 196, man? Yeah, 215.6 microliters of PBS. Okay, man. There we go. So that's how you're going to calculate that. So now go ahead and do that for your own sample. You already should have the quantification from last time when we were in class. So looking at how much protein you have per micro, you know, milligrams per milliliter or micrograms per microliter, however you want to look at it, do the same exact formula that we just did and calculate the amount of brain protein that you would need and how much PBS to dilute it in in order to get 100 micrograms per milliliter final concentration. So I don't remember what time we started the secondary intuition. Was it like around 9.45, right? Like 9.40 or 9.45? Okay. So it's been 15, 16, 17, 18. Okay, so we need another. The protocol says, what, 30 minutes? So yeah, so 30 minutes is the minimum that we like to keep that. So secondary can give you a lot of background. Um, the minimum time is 30 minutes. You don't want to do more than one hour either. Typically, we do 45 minutes. Uh, in a research setting, we'll do 30 minutes today. That sounds fine. So around 10, 15, we'll go to the next. And that would give us just enough time to finish our question number five after this. So question number five is kind of the same idea as what we talked about earlier with our wash buffer. This time you have 20x, 20 times concentrated buffer and stock buffer. And you need to prepare a 500 ml amount of the 1x. 
So just like we worked out for our 10 CBS, you just need to take that into account and do the same calculation. <clears throat> so for number two, um, could you go more into detail about how you would choose either a one to five or one to 10? Um, yes. So typically for those, I look at the accuracy of my dilution, okay? So technically yeah. speaking, and I don't know who samples these are, so I'm not throwing anyone into the bus, I'm just showing. Uh, my one fifth absorbance in an ideal world would be this divided by this uh, by five should be 0.288. Well, this one says 0.785. So this is more like a one half than a one fifth, right? Do you guys see that? Um, and then my one tenth should be a tenth of my undiluted, right? So it should be this divided by 10 or 0.144. And so neither one of these are accurately made in, a, in this particular set. And so typically I would look at the ones and I will say, which one is more accurate? And that's the one that I would use. Uh, now, why they are not accurately made? I, I think in the original protocol, it wasn't one fifth, it, or it was uh, is one, it one half. It one is one half. half. Because that's what it seems like. It seems that it's perfectly one half. So, you know, and if you see that, that, you know, it is perfectly one half, then that's what you have to take into account. Let me look at the protocol and see what it is saying. Shall we go and see? Just, I feel that this is not something that people would have done incorrectly, frankly. So I think it's the dilution. And I know it says one fifth. But maybe it's not the only one. Where are the dilutions? Oh, sorry. Three to twelve. Well, three to twelve is one fifth, though. And three to twenty seven is one tenth. So not quite sure why people are looking more one half and one fifth. So but technically, you know, like you would say that hey, it is which one is correctly made, and that's the one that you would use. If neither are correctly made, then typically what you would do is you would use the undiluted because that's the one that's most accurate. You didn't dilute it, so you didn't add any other error to it in addition to what is there already. Um, but that may not work if you're using a polynomial equation. And so in that case, you would just use whichever one seems to be most accurate and go with that one. Okay? Okay. Yeah, I don't think anybody's looks one fifth. Looks like a one fifth, which is funny. Nobody's one tenth looks like a one fifth either, though. So it's even more funny. To do the crop protein counts, should we use the class data or the individual? You have to use your own standard curve and your own numbers, not the class data. The class data is just for the demo. So you're doing all the calculations using your own data this time. Okay. Um, right. I just meant if we used this Excel that you have open, or like we also have individual no, you ones. Use your own. You should use your own. Okay. Yeah. All right. 
So that's where we would take an average of both people's one, one to five and one to 10. Okay. Oh, I was muted. Never mind. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to open this like that. Oops, to see if you can see this. Oh, come on. What's wrong with you? Computer. Not computer. Tablet. I just like to have my thing. Yeah, so for group data, you know, you'll have your sample um, and you'll have your, I'm assuming this is the one test and the one test. So you just look at these. Um, you cannot really tell if your one test is made accurately if you don't have an undiluted next to it. But in this case too, you can um, think about, well, if this is my one fifth and this is my one tenth, then this should be about half of that, right? and um, see if that is the case. Otherwise, just use your one fifth. Also looking at your range of the standard curve, you wanna, if you can stay within the linear portion of your standard curve, right? If even if it's a polynomial equation, you're gonna get a better accuracy for your quantification. So uh, frankly, these numbers 0.812 and 0.968 are gonna give you better accuracy as compared to one and 1 1.2, which are gonna be getting to that plateau region of your standard curve. So that's something to keep in mind as well, that exactly where is it falling in your standard curve, the absorbance, um, an absorbance that is too much at, towards the edge ends of your standard curve are not gonna be as accurate, okay? Oh no, I don't know why it's muting me. So sad. Well, I hope these membranes work. Um, the secondary antibody was already pre aliquoted It was in the freezer, so it should be fine. But uh, that makes me nervous because I'm used to taking it from an actual tube that's labeled versus a bag that's labeled with lots of like little tiny tubes inside it with predetermined amount of antibodies in it. They're trying to silence me, I guess so. Oh my goodness. No, I still can do this job. I have uh, some Imperial stain gel here for Friday section. They loaded their samples incorrectly, so they didn't load marker with each group. They just loaded all their own samples next to one marker. Fun stuff. And then they're like, half the gel is empty. I'm like, why? What did you do? So they reloaded them properly, and then I just stained these with blue. So they can see their pale pink. And they look pretty. Just make yours very nice. And these are the equalized ones, so they are very equal. They look very good. They look good. Hmm, it's about 10.15. Should we go ahead and move to the next step? 
Okay, let's go. Ah. So let's go, let's go. Did you see her uh, transfer video? Isn't this entertaining? Let's see what's happening. Okay, where else? Where are we? Right here. Okay, so um, unlike primary antibodies, secondaries cannot be reused. They are pretty much done the first time, and they're just going to give you bad background. They're not going to work very well. So we are going to not do that. Then I'm going to save it. I'm just going to throw that and I'm going to be washing my membranes with a quick wash, a quick aggressive wash of the buffer first. We're going to do a quick aggressive wash and then we'll do a couple of more gentle washes. For all these steps, you know, um, I'm not wearing gloves right now, but I'm not touching the uh, the membranes. I do not want to touch the membranes with my bare fingers, right? Because that's going to get my proteins on them and it's going to give you a thumbprint or a fingerprint or whatever on your gel, on your membrane rather, and that's not going to give you good results. So you, what you want to do is you want to either wear gloves while handling the membrane or not handle it at all. Or you can use tweezers or something clean to move them from one place to another if you need that. God, <laughs> it's sleeping over there and snoring. Leave it for a few minutes and then we'll watch it. Everyone's good with their um, calculations? Yeah? For our AP conjugate substrate, we are going to be using this biorad of hit. There. It's a color metric assay. Um, so it has the substrate and the developer to you know, start the process and interact with the alkaline phosphatase in separate containers. So it has the uh, BSIP and the NBT solution, so the solution A and B um, that we that are at one to, that are at 50 x concentration. So you use one ml of that in a 50 ml total volume, and then the developer is 25 times concentrated, 25 x. That's the stock solution. I have that right here. Uh, well, this is my water to dilute it in. So I have two mLs of my developer here that I'm going to put in 48 mLs of water to get my 1x, since the developer is 25x. And then to that, I'm going to add one mL each of solution A and B, which are the BSIP and NBT solutions that are going to interact with alkaline phosphatase. And then the developer is going to show us the color change. Okay. Is 
go ahead and change the wash one more time. My brain got a little bit. So one of these is actually a nylon membrane, and the other two are our usual microcellulose. Um, so there was some nylon membrane that was also sitting there, and I just wanted to see how well it works. Uh, it binds proteins very well, so hopefully it will work as well. The bad part about the nylon membrane is that you cannot look, you know, you do the ponzo staining with it to see how well your transfer worked. You kind of just have to believe it. Uh, same thing with PVDF membranes. So in the module, there are uh, the my lecture in there on amino blotting goes through all the different membranes, what they are good for, when we would use one over the other, and how uh, they might affect protein binding and protein detection. Because it does matter. Right. I made a good job with this stuff. Okay. Any questions? No. Let this go for filter 25 ish. We'll give it a five minute wash and then we will be ready for the final detection. So when we are using a chemiluminescent uh, agent, we will have two different ways that we can look at the signal. A lot of our gel documentation systems nowadays, including the one in our labs and the teaching lab in the prep room, can detect chemiluminescent signal, so we can detect it on there. And usually, you know, each time, each protein that you are detecting, each time that you run your Westons, the quality of your proteins, all of that are going to determine how strong the signal is, how easy it is to detect. And typically we start off by doing a one minute uh, exposure, we examine it, and if it is too much, then we go down, depending on how much it is, right? You can go down to 30 seconds, 15 seconds, even one second. Sometimes all you need is like a quick second uh, to get the signal if it's a very abundant protein. On the flip side, if that signal is not enough or very faint, then you could do higher exposure. You could do two minutes, three minutes, five minutes, even a long exposure, like 15 minutes or a 30 minute one. Um, typically, if you have to do a 30 minute, you probably to have either a very, very, very low abundant protein, so very, very low quantity in the sample, or the antibody didn't work so good. Maybe you overwashed it or something else happened. So that's just something to be aware of there as well. Um, the second way that you can look at a chemiluminescent signal is by using films, just, you know, and a dark room and a developer for it. Um, that gives you very crisp, clean results you have the ability to change it out very quickly, figure it out very quickly in real time uh, in the dark, which is cool. And that's our preferred method when we are getting our samples ready for or our data ready for publication, especially that gives the best results. Um, and in that case, you would go in there, you would examine. And in the dark, if you have a lot of protein at a particular in a particular sample, um, 
that for the one that you're looking at, you would actually see kind of green glowing bands. So, you know, we call it like it lit up like a Christmas tree. It's just an expression we use. But it's basically, you know, in those cases, you just need a one second exposure. You put your phone down, you pick it up and you put it in the developer. And again, typically, if you don't see something right away, what we do is a one minute exposure first in our film with our film. Um, and while that is then running through the developer, I will usually do a one second one, a five second one and then a long one. And so I have several films that are going quickly one after the other so I can get the one that I want with the perfect amount of exposure, nice crisp bands that I can then use for my uh, study or for my papers. Okay, so I shall remove the wash buffer and then we are gonna go ahead Here is the developer. I'm going to add solution A and B together first, and then add them to my developer. Everything was on ice, so it was at four degrees because that's where it was stable. And now I'm going to add that to my maps. And hope for the best. Just look at it and see if Um, it can take a little bit to develop the color. Uh, from what I have heard, I've actually never used a color matrix Western ever in my life until today. I've always used a chemiluminescent one. Even when I did AP conjugated antibodies. Um, so this is just, ah, first one for me too. This is why you don't do it like this. I'm gonna make myself bigger. Okay, scratch, scratch, scratch. Hold it. On my cold Yeah. Where do you go? Since I made 50 ml, I had a lot of it in there, and you just three. So, ooh, I do see signal coming in, two of them for sure. Yes. So I let that signal develop and I'm gonna clean off the developer that fell on my right. Okay. Goodness, it looks so good, guys. I wish I could. I can show you in a second. Well, definitely, signal is appearing in two, the two plots that I had done for Tuesday and Friday. Um, nylon one is not showing the signal yet. Let's see. I don't know if you guys can see. So this is the Friday blot. And it has that bubble that I outlined with a pencil, so I knew where the bubble was. And actually, the band is right underneath that. Do you guys see the band or no? The band starting to appear, the purple color? Yep. And this is you guys' samples. And again, you can see the purple bands beginning to appear. So I think we'll give it a little bit more time. So there's, you know, that last sample doesn't have it. And then that one with very little protein, that one, I don't see a band yet. But all the others, I see a clear band. 
Yes, they are faint right now. They are faint. It's getting darker slowly. So you that's what you do. You know, you monitor it until it gets to the level that you like and you don't want it to be overexposed either, right? So you should start to you should be beginning to see more of it, right? Do you see it getting darker? Yep. It's slowly so it's getting like darker, a, right? It's like a Polaroid. Uh, yes. Issue. And that's exactly, by the way, that's, you know, like with our, uh, it's like a Polaroid, right? And when we do the chemiluminescent signal, um, that's essentially what it is, is a Polaroid, right? So we take a film, actual film, and we are putting it on and we are taking it off. So here you can see the Friday ones, by the way, again. And you see how in their case too, there are some of the lanes were maybe not as clean. So um, they have small bands or not consistent size bands, two of their samples like that too. The rest of them are good. And here, because there was a bubble, it kind of distorted the way the lanes ran underneath the bubble. But overall, they're in the right place. But yeah, I think this one's looking good. I don't want to do much more than that, maybe. Maybe a little bit more, but not maybe a minute more or so, because I don't want to get background, right? Right now, it's super clean. You're seeing nice, clean crab. That's great. I love it. So I bet, because colorimetric essays tend to be a whole less sensitive than chemiluminescent. If this was a chemiluminescent assay, we would be looking at literally like a one second or five second exposure for this to get a good signal. This looks pretty good. Um, so I will say my nylon membrane is not working. It did not give a signal. So I think it was ordered by mistake or we ordered the nitrocellulose, but our lab manager got the nitrous, uh, the nylon instead of nitrocellulose by mistake. Uh, and I was hoping it would work at least, but it doesn't. It's okay. Okay, I think this is good signal. What do you guys think? You guys want to do a little bit more, or do you think this is good signal? Ooh, you know that one that had less protein? It's beginning to show now too. Very faint, but it's there. Should we let it go a little bit more so we can maybe see a little bit darker in that one for that one group? Maybe one minute more. Yeah, let's do one minute more and then we'll stop. Yeah, for the one, one. <laughs> I know. But otherwise, for the rest of them, I think it looks great. And if anything, I'm beginning to see a second band in those that had a lot of protein. Um, that could be like, again, a little bit, maybe back. Yeah, it's, this is beginning to show back. I don't know. I'm going to take it off, but you do have a second band and that could be the phosphorylated version or the unphosphorylated version, depending on how you look at it. Yeah, they're beginning to get bad ones. So I'm going to go ahead and they're beginning to show purple. Yeah, so the nylon one didn't work. And the only thing that shows up in there is like a purple background and uh, a thumbprint. And then uh, these ones worked great. The ones for you guys, beautiful. Everyone has a band. The last one is kind of, you know, it was degraded and smeared, so not good. Everyone has a good band. Um, a few of them have the two bands. Most of them have one. Um, try to do, because I don't know why, uh, but they have bands, 
Perfect. You guys good? So that's basically our lab for today. And next time we're going to be talking about ELISA and going into detail about that and how we're going to be running it. So those pictures are going to be uploaded? Yep. In a little bit, I'm going to take the pictures. I'm going to let it uh, de uh, not de-stain the, because they suddenly started to get purple in the background. So I just added, uh, remove this uh, developer and added water, which is going to remove some of that purple. And then I'll take a picture and I will be posting it. Okay. Sounds okay. good. Cool. And so we will be able to look at them and we will be able to see. Obviously you can tell already, right? That if you had less protein in one sample, then it's not gonna show as much signal. Um, but you'll be able to look at your sample and you'll be able to see how much you had or relatively how much you had compared to the other groups. And next time we will be, you know, once we do ELISA, we will be able to quantify it and see how much was there. So that's all guys. Let's stop the share.